Thank you to Zahra for conceiving of this brilliant idea for a book and getting all these wonderful, accomplished women to write for the book, to Penguin for uh, taking the opportunity to publish this, and I hope eventually even bring it to an Arabic audience. Um, uh, but certainly this uh, has already made a big splash in this publication. Um, uh, Neda and Huayda, of course, are two journalists that I've been connected to for a very long time and a, a very long, um, amazing history. And I'm so grateful to both of you for everything that, that you brought to my life and to, to journalism. Um, I think, uh, you know, we'll, we'll keep this very informal. So you, you have the bios of our great speakers uh, separately and we don't have to go into all the details. I think what we want to jump directly in, as Allison said, this book includes uh, writers and journalists from all over the Arab world, from, from Algeria to Palestine to Iraq to um, everywhere you can think of. Um, and, uh, and, and, I, and I should also mention that like many collections that focus on women or focus on a particular ethnic group or, or anything else, uh, that is not to the exclusion of simply being a book of incredible journalism. And the point of having collections like this, I think, is really just to make sure that all those voices are heard. Um, and, and really, this is, this is a, a, a group of essays of and about journalism that, that anybody should read from any region. Um, but by coincidence, all three of our amazing women panelists here today are Lebanese. And I don't think that, that we should waste another moment before discussing what's happening right now in Lebanon. Um, we can give uh, maybe whoever speaks first, give a you know, 30 second synopsis of what's happening in case anyone here is not already following it obsessively. <laughs> but I think, you know, thinking about what you guys have all written, Zahra, uh, of course, uh, You've been through AUB student politics, which sometimes is saltifyingly just a student elections are just a copy of partisan national elections divided largely along sectarian or very um, saltified old political lines. Um, so you're, you're talking about a brand new brand of politics that, that has come out. Neda, you have this very striking scene in your essay about the way um, a, a political moment on the street could veer extremely suddenly into deadly violence. Um, we're seeing something very different right now in Lebanon. And uh, Wayda, you've talked to me about your um, uh, you know, sense that, that you, were, you could feel included for the first time in a political moment in, in Lebanon that you, in a way that you haven't seen before in your entire life. So I would actually just like to hear you each as journalists and as Lebanese people talk about What's going on? What's the role of the media now? And what's the role of, of women? And, and how, how do you analyze this moment in Lebanon? Maybe you want to start? No, you should start. You're from Lebanon. Yeah. <laughs> You're just there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. And I would like to thank you all for having me here. So I was uh, following up another story. And uh, actually, the story, her story is from Lebanon and her story is about Syria. So actually, she was. You know, she was the first to follow her steps and to to to, to get to, like the ideas she was putting in her stories. That was the first thing. I want to thank her and uh, Anne Bernard, of course. She was also uh, the person who always uh, encouraged me to write, to put my uh, my stories. And always, I was like, uh, you know, confused whether should I I should put them or not. And she always always used to tell me whether you should put down your stories. And actually, I would also like to thank Zahra Hakir because actually Zahra, she was determined to make me write this essay. Because without her, I, I was really lazy and I thought my stories were, weren't much important. And these were three women in my life. Of course, you know, without them, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be here. So really, amazing woman. And I would move to something else about what's happening in my country. So my country, for the first time, we have a peaceful uprising in my country, which is I, it's something very, uh, I, I, I don't want to say it's strange, it's something uh, unusual, because for the first time in my country, we have people from the different sects, they coming together, they, 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 they decided to revolt against corruption. And this is something, for, you know, because in, in Lebanon, we always have an issue, what's the corruption and who's the corrupt? 
So for the first time, people, they decided to say, yes, there is corruption, and we, will, we should have this uprising. And this is something unusual for me, because uh, given that, uh, given my, you know, I always lived in the civil war, and in the civil war, we were always divided between sects, and all the sects, they are affiliated with uh, certain parties and certain leaders. So this is something uh, really, that was really uh, a turning, a shift in uh, Netherlands policy. Of course, I will, I will, and uh, actually the turning point in this uprising is the role the woman is, is playing in it now. Because I always had an issue in, in Lebanon, especially the, the image of the Lebanese woman, as if like the Lebanese woman should like, uh, she, you know, she always has to look pretty and then do not say anything. For the first time, no, we are pretty and we are doing something. <laughs> So it, 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 it changed, it changed the idea, like, you know, okay, you know, you have pretty women in the, in the, in the, in the streets, at the same time, they say something serious. <clears throat> so this is amazing. <clears throat> Sorry. <clears throat> well, uh, you know, like, of course, the situation is in Lebanon is very complicated. Um, I'm not expecting much to change. It's more complicated, uh, what do you think? It's, it's a closed circle. But it's it's good. It's good to do it. It's it's always good. And also, like um, you know, for me, I covered Syria in the past years, and uh, always I was amazed about like how this, how the demonstrations have started in Syria, and how the women also they in Syria the women like also the, we have the women they had they 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 played a crucial role in the demonstrations, although they they were they weren't very visible. It's like, like and now we have women voices from Syria. They they uh, contacted me and they they encouraging us as a Lebanese woman, which is something really great. Like you know, they they, they uh, you know they said you know we want to follow your steps in that. So hopefully things will uh, will work in Lebanon and uh, and hopefully our like environment we will have uh, you know clean environment where we just get rid of. We're asking for simple things in, in Lebanon. We're not asking for something like you know. For instance, I was in Italy a month ago. And there was, an Iraq, there was an Iraqi woman, she asked me why you are protesting in Lebanon. I said simply because we don't have water and electricity. And she said, what? You don't have water and electricity? I said, okay, this is what, we don't have water and electricity. This is the simplest thing. Mm -hmm. So this is one of the things we, we need to change, hopefully. So we don't know. <laughs> Let's hope for the better. Yes. Maybe Zahra can just pick her up and just um, maybe I can continue. Thank you, Waila, for those wonderful thoughts. Um, very quickly, you just want to thank AUB New York so much. This is a particularly emotional moment for me because I fell in love with journalism at AUB, and that was my front line, College Hall, right there, um, for, for two years. And um, this is full circle for me, so I'm very grateful to you for having us here today. Um, I want to follow up a little bit on what Waila was saying on, in terms of the role of women. I think if we look specifically um, at activists, um, that women, women actors and women, women journalists, they're both playing such a substantial role in this revolution or, or uprising. And um, at the same time, they're facing harassment and threats. And you know, looking at, at that dynamic there, um, to me, echoes some of what is, is in the book, which is the power of the woman, the power that the woman wields on the field. And um, as we know, uh, these women activists have been doing this work for a very long time, but the attention now has been thrown on women in specific. And um, in terms of what we would expect from them or what we would hope, I think um, I'm similarly cautious, like you, Hueda, but I do feel that this is work that women have been doing for quite a while in Lebanon to, I mean, for example, you see these women on the streets calling for um, allowing women to pass nationality Lebanese nationality onto their children. Um, you saw, you know, mothers and daughters coming together on the streets and renouncing any violence that might lead to a civil war. These are all realities and things that women in Lebanon have been pushing for. And I think this is such a special moment in Lebanon because, you know, the women are now getting the attention. We're, we're spotlighting the women and we're giving them credit and we're calling it the women's revolution. And it's not to say that they weren't there before looking pretty and doing great things. They were, but now we're really seeing it because the, the levels of exasperation um, uh, when it comes to the economy, I would say that you know the, there's there's exasperation, there's desperation, there's exhaustion. The fact that there's been so much impunity and 
this is a turning point for Lebanon, and it is, I would hope that it's a turning point for Lebanese women. I don't know if it means that we will see any immediate change in, in the law, but the fact that the women are pushing forward in this way, and some of the leaders in, in Lebanese media right now are women journalists on the ground who are posting on Twitter, who are posting on Facebook Live, who are um, doing independent journalism, who are working for establishment um, news organizations in Lebanon, and then have had to resign for whatever reason. So again, for me, when I look at this revolution, I look first and foremost at, at the women. And um, all of that, I think, the spirit of that is echoed in this book and in the work that Nana and Hueva have been doing for many years. Yes. Um, thanks again for having us here. Um, yeah, I just echoed Hueva and uh, uh, Zahra from what they said. And I'm just going to add how I personally felt about this uprising, like the way they called it, um, I was really very, very impressed and inspired um, seeing these people, young and female, and I really, I mean, growing up in Lebanon, um, you had at a very young age to define yourself along sectarian uh, lines or, you know, political affiliations, you had to make that known, and if you're not, people will ask you right away. Um, but, and I really never thought that there are so many people who are actually tired of this and done with it and don't feel this way anymore. And we, you know, we saw that. Um, women and, and men and young and old, and it was, it was really, really inspiring. And, um, you know, Anna and I were talking earlier about these um, dialogues that they are organizing every day in the square in downtown Beirut and uh, just the level of sophistication and uh, intellect and uh, that these women and young people are bringing is really amazing. Um, there's also a lot of um, social media campaigns. Um, there was this, um, this one, uh, um, it was like a video clip of women talking about um, Sharaf or Sharaf, or something. Do you guys see that one? I mean, yes, it was really amazing. It's just kind of like you know, I'm independent. I'm gonna say what I want to say, and it has nothing to do with your, with the men's you know dignity or <laughs> honor. Exactly, <laughs> honor. Yes. Um, so that was really amazing too. It just really drew a line that that's enough of of intimidating us all these years, and you know, linking. And honor to what we do, or can't speak because we're going to, uh, uh, you know, hurt the men's honor. Or no, yeah, sure. So, um, just sorry, I just wanted to add to that very quickly. Is further to that actually, um, I think that uh, we're breaking through a barrier, Lebanese women, and talking about sexual assault, um, and that's actually happening right now as we speak because. Um, there's a story that, that um, came to be known quite recently about a man who's been harassing women and uh, yes. has been accused of mm. assaulting and potentially yeah. raping. I don't know the exact details. Yeah. But suddenly, actually, a lot of Lebanese women are taking to social media and are writing about sexual assault in Lebanon, which, again, is incredible. So you have this moment in time where the women are mobilizing around issues that have been prevalent in Lebanon for a long time. So I do think this, this revolution is, is, is multi yeah, it's a breaking barrier. And we saw the labor issues coming up with the unionization drive at the Daily Star, and just there are many sort of sub-revolutions that are riffing off this revolution. But I want I want to just uh, ask you guys to to uh, maybe add yet another layer to this, um, because Neda was talked about the shut off, like the, the idea of honor. Um, it, it actually uh, I was thinking while all of you were speaking that um, that. You know, in the Arab Spring or the Arab revolts that uh, began almost 10 years ago, uh, there has been a false dichotomy sort of put out there in, in the way these things are analyzed, especially by the powers that be that preferred to see these revolts fail. Um, in which, uh, whether it's authoritarian leaders in the region or Islamophobic uh, politicians in the West or, or whoever it may be, that there has been an adoption of the idea that um, that a, a so-called secular authoritarian government, uh, that let's say like the Assad government in Syria um, or Sisi's government in Egypt, that that these are the only bulwark against some kind of extremist uh, 
uh, you know, atavistic uh, Islamist alternative, as if that's the only alternative. And that's often done in the name of women. It's often done in the name of women's choices about how to live, how to dress, how to uh, you know, be in charge of their bodies, how to be in charge of their religious identity. Um, and uh, Lebanon has always been a bit of an exception in the region by being a multi-sectarian country where women uh, definitely like live in every possible style that you could imagine. As you said, it was very on brand for the Lebanese revolution to be full of beautiful women taking selfies in front of bonfires and riot police and stuff like this. But at the same time, it was a deadly serious revolution. And what I noticed is that women are refusing to let themselves be used that way. So in other words, uh, there, there could be a simple way of seeing this revolution, and, and sometimes you see even like sometimes the, the pro Assad, the pro Sisi people that are uh, somehow supporting the Lebanese revolution and being seen. It's a revolution with like women who are not wearing hijab or something like this. Okay, the w Lebanese women are not letting it be that simple. You know, I've noticed that they're saying, uh, you know, when when um, when for instance. Uh, there was a threat of violence when uh, thugs came out uh, representing some of the political parties and tried to scare people out of the square. There was a march by both Christian and Muslim women uh, to meet in the middle of their two neighborhoods and to say, we reject these political parties, whichever side they're on, trying to uh, uh, take the, the, you know, the, 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 this revolution into something violent. So I, I would love for you guys to talk about, as women, as journalists, as Lebanese women, um, you know, is there necessarily a dichotomy in the region between uh, some kind of social liberalism that, that allows some kind of superficial women's rights? Can that only exist under a, um, a, an authoritarian type of government that doesn't listen to all the democratic voices? Or do you see in, in Lebanon and in this revolution some kind of opening there? Is there, is there, is there something happening that, that is fighting back against that? Well, I would say in Lebanon, like, uh, okay, in terms of the government, well, they are somehow open to that. Anyway, not not much. Okay, we are we have our women representative in the, in the parliament, in the cabinet, but I always have a question mark on on the women representation in our government. It, I'm not, I was never been satisfied or pleased. Like I feel like they 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 they, they are there just to show off. Like for instance, we have uh, some, you know, like someone like she's an MP, and she always she, she she only goes to the parliament to show off like what she's wearing. And this is a problem. Like okay, you know, you can, you can be uh, at the same time you can you can be wearing something nice at the same at the same time you be, you can be effective. I always have a question mark on that. You know, like so women are like the window dressing. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you know, we have a serious issue. We have our problems in Lebanon. I see like it, sh it should be that in a more serious way. So this is my question, and also in the media. Also, we have it, uh, women in the media. Also, they uh, they try uh, in a way when 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 uh, especially when the way they were covering the uprising. Also, they were trying to cover the uprising uh, uh, not because they believe in the revolution, just because they were sort of like because now we have this you know we have a revolution in Lebanon, so we want we want to be more famous, and then we join the revolution. This is a question mark. This is not like the, you know, like if a woman and the, you know, when I'm talking about women in, pol in, in politics or women in, in the parliament or women in the uprising, it 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 it, 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 it you know it should it should be given a, a more important image to the to the public, because as as we've seen in the uprising, really the women the Lebanese women they managed to prove their image and actually for the time being, the men they looking more seriously to us. For instance. In the past, when I used to drive, you know, driving course is a very simple thing in Lebanon, you drive. Always men, they make fun of us, how we drive. They try to give us instructions. Nowadays, no, they don't. They don't. They believe, wow, so you, 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 know, you are a good driver. This is the first shift in, this, you know, in, in our daily life. So, you know, it's still early to, to judge, but this is, these, are, these are small examples. Really. But I want to focus on the women's role in the media, in the local media, really. Like, it's, it's, the media is not like trying, to, like trying to, to be more famous or trying to show off or trying. I, I just really, I want to focus on this issue because the media is, journalism and media is not just, you know, going on TV and then, you know, show your hair or makeup. It's deeper than this. 
Well, th this is like what happened to Weida recently. A, a young Lebanese woman came up to her in a cafe and said, you're Weida Saad. And Weida, Weida realized that, that is, she's not uh, known because of, of her face being on TV, which it's not very often. It's about her words. Um, and so I just wondered if you guys have, have seen uh, examples lately with the recent round of, of uprisings in the region with Iraq, with, with Algeria, with, with Lebanon. Are there women voices, are there women in the media that are taking a different role than what you've seen before? And then what, you know, what do you see as, as opportunities here? Um, I, I try to, to emphasize the point that, that these women have been doing this excellent work for years and years and years, and that now they're getting more attention than the attention that they deserve. And I think that when they get more attention, there's a snowball effect, whereby more and more women will feel that they want to be journalists and they will want to be at the front line as well. So in that respect, I do think that we are, um, that there, there are more women's voices that are, that are more easily accessible than they once were. But there still remain core issues that women face. I mean, if you look at the level of you know, harassment and threats and detention um, that women across the region um, face, it's still dire. And I think that um, while we, we celebrate the fact that there are more women doing this work, we must also acknowledge the challenges that they face, which is uh, um, to turn to this book, what this book highlights is that they face those challenges and then they, they're incredibly savvy about how they then rise above the challenges. And that takes me back actually to what you were saying before, that there is a level of savviness on the ground where the women realize that the spotlight is on them and they say, okay, what are we gonna do with this spotlight? And I think that that's incredibly, incredibly encouraging and I'm, and I'm actually in all of the women. And I wanted to um, comment just a little bit on, on your initial <laughs> question. This is, the heart of this revolution is, um, is economic desperation. Um, and uh, the desire uh, among all Lebanese is social justice and, and dignity and basic rights. Uh, the way I mentioned earlier, there's no electricity, there's no water. And because of that, this is, it, I, I can't, I, I kind of find it bizarre to look at it through a sectarian lens because it really does cut through sect in a way that I haven't seen in Lebanon. I mean, I, in 2005, I was, um, you know, I, I was at those protests and obviously the, the the goal of that protest or the feeling of that protest was different. It was political by nature. There was a very specific political goal there. It was to do with the Hadith assassination, Syrian presence in Lebanon. You didn't have the same inclusivity that you see on the ground now. And whether that's the youth or whether that's women or that's my 60-year-old mother, I always try to bring my mother into, into my talks, um, you know, of any sect, really. It, it has, you know, I mean, the sectarianism to me is, is an afterthought. That said, it's still important because it plays a role in terms of the geopolitics that swirls around Lebanon and that is not going anywhere. And also, there are people who are loyal to certain leaders in Lebanon. That remains a fact. There are weapons in Lebanon, but it is bright with weaponry. So while we can be very encouraged by what we witness, um, and we, I've discussed this with Meda, things can turn violent very, very quickly. For now, we're very lucky that they haven't. The question is what happens next. But it is about, at this point, it's, it's about cutting through that sectarianism, being aware that those elements are all, all there, and <coughs> seeing what happens next. Um, yes, going back to your initial question, too, I mean, you mentioned these two regimes being secular, but then if you look at the societies in both Syria and Egypt and Iraq, I mean, you know, people have become a lot more religious than they were 10 years ago and 20 years ago and 30. I mean, if you look at Egypt in the 50s and 60s and 70s, it's so a lot more liberal and, and progressive than it is today. So I don't really know. I mean, they, and they're, you know, they're, they're making it work and they, they are scaring people into thinking that um, having these secular uh, regimes is, is is a way to keep fundamentalists um, away, but I don't really, I don't really, I don't know if that is, um, I mean, the, you know, these societies are already very religious, so they're expressing them in a way that's creating all sorts of problems. I would like also to add something, because with the uprisings, we all, we, we always, it always started with something very big and very nice in a way, like Syria and Lebanon, like now I put Syria and Lebanon because I cover both countries. For instance, in Syria, it started in a great way, 
and now our like Zena dreams now to get just the basics, just to get a toilet, a WC. Imagine I was talking to women in Idlib. She was demonstrating and she was asking for you know for something you know for reforms, for like uh, you know things to be to get better in her country. Now she's displaced, and the, her only dream is to get a toilet. Now this is my field in Lebanon. We have great demands, and we have a great aspiration. But I'm afraid, you know, all these demands will be lost, among other things, and just the things will get worse. This is my fear. I mean, I think to that point as well that it's incredibly grim. I mean, there's been a spate of suicides in, in Lebanon rooted in the economic desperation that I was just talking about, and um, it's the country itself is at a, you know, in terms of the economy. Um, is it's basically on the brink of economic collapse, if not already in, in collapse. So, um, you know, I think we can't turn away from the roots of this being, being um, economic. And um, obviously, you look at each um, country, um, you can't look at them in isolation, but there is a thread there where, if you're looking at what's happening in Iraq as well, the spark has been economic. If you look at parts of the Arab Spring or countries in, in the Arab Spring, what's unique in Lebanon now is the fact that there have been. I mean, there have been three deaths, I think, in total. Um, but if you compare that to Iraq and, and, and Iran, where you've had hundreds of deaths, I mean, that's, that's encouraging. But it's, it's overall still sort of like Well, I think you guys are all speaking to the point that, that uh, women journalists and women's voices have been very clear in keeping the focus on real life, daily life, practical issues. Women are not letting themselves be uh, used as a symbol, and they're saying, you, you, and talk about secular, but your secular regime is not giving me freedom as a woman, in fact. It's not protecting me as a woman, even if you claim it is. So I'm, I'm hearing all of these voices in the essays in your book in different ways. Women saying, um, and this will bring me to my next topic, really, women in your book are you know, one example after the other of uh, Arab women using their voice to say, I'm going to use my voice myself. My voice is not going to be used by someone in the West to talk about the oppression of Arab women mm -hmm. as if that's something that, that is a way of talking down the region or, or uh, condescending to it in some way. It's, it's, it's completely uh, different from that. Um, and I want to shift the, the, the conversation a little bit now to, to address that. Um, you can speak to what motivated you to, to compile such a book, but, but what I see as, as a journalist working in the region is that over the last 20 years, almost since 9-11, since we really do see an amazing influence by Arab journalists on the way the region is covered in the media. The way, of course, it has a long way to go, but in terms of who is listened to, how accurate our coverage is, what kinds of stories we tell, what kinds of people we give credit to in our reporting, what kinds of bylines we have, what kinds of uh, characters are, are seen as, as people to focus on in the story. How much have each of you as journalists felt able to influence uh, the outlets that you work for, and to push them in a good direction on this? What have been some of the struggles along the way? And could you mention some experiences in your own reporting, or maybe even from others' essays in the book, uh, where someone is, is using their voice to reclaim this, uh, this subject as, as one where the, the, the region itself is speaking and not being spoken about. Yeah, um, so there's a couple of things there in terms of, you know, I think rejection of victimization is, is such an important theme in this book, and thank you for taking that out. Um, in terms of what inspired me to put the book together, it is, um, uh, to my mind, a problem with the narrative. Um, not being as inclusive as it should be, and all of the questions that you raise now in terms of you know what are we reading, who's writing, what, sort of, what you know where is this byline coming from, who are we crediting? I think a lot of Western media organizations are making strides forward. I mean the fact that the way that um, alone is employed in this, you know at the New York Times and has such influence on the work there is, is incredible. But there's still much work to be done, and I still think we need to see more diversity and plurality in newsrooms and also in the Western um, publishing space. <laughs> um, we so often see memoirs written um, and authoritative nonfiction books written by Western correspondents who go to the region and you know, spend a few years there and come out. And to my mind, you know, I want every single woman in this book to write a memoir. I want to see 
the market flooded by memoirs written by our opponent journalists. Um, and so that's um, partially speaking to your initial question. In terms of examples of, um, I, I don't want to speak about my career. I covered um, the Arab Spring from the economic perspective. So you know, I was eating sushi with bankers. I wasn't. Um, <laughs> I wasn't at the Square. So um, what I will say is, I'll give a couple of examples on this idea of reporting inside out. Right. So Amir Al Sharif is, is a Yemeni photojournalist, um, incredibly, incredibly determined to reverse the narrative, the dominant narrative of what was happening in Yemen, which is you know the Western media coverage is understandably. Again, you know, it's um, it's not surprising, and, it, and, and I, I do think you know there's, there are filters there that, that they need to be filters there because Western audiences expect a certain type of coverage. But she wanted to um, to reverse this idea of the victimization of Yemeni people um, and the fact that images of Yemen were all of their destruction and death and famine. So she turned her attention to um, Yemeni women, uh, resilient Yemeni women. And um, this also speaks to the fact that she has access to those spaces that Western correspondents might not be able to access because she is a Yemeni woman and understands all of the nuances that it involves. How do you get access? How do you enter the private home of a Yemeni woman whose husband is away at war and whose children are starving? Um, so she focused all of her efforts on that to produce this beautiful body of work that shows the resilience of Yemeni women. And that's her reclaiming the narrative and telling her own story, a story that she wants. She actually says at one point, I, I wish that you know Western media would be flooded with these with this imagery. And then there's um, also another photojournalist, Iman Hilal, um, who's Egyptian, who experienced um, sexual harassment herself and decided to use her camera as a weapon where she was raising awareness about women who were enduring sexual harassment, in particular in the aftermath of the uprising in Egypt. And again, that is her taking control of her narrative. She's saying, okay, the coverage of Egypt is, you know, it's skewing in this direction, or perhaps attention is waning. This is what I want to focus on because sexual harassment is predominant in Egypt in her own experience and in her own view. And she's turning then the story around on its head and, and you know, saying, okay, this is the story that I want to be telling. So um, those are just two examples in a book that is filled with them. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think of stories that I've worked on or wrote from, you know, all the Arab countries that I um, covered, and I, I, don't, I, I can't really think of a particular one where I felt like I changed the narrative or brought a more, you know, uh, a fuller picture or a, a more local um, take on it. Um, I don't know why, maybe it was just... Um, to mainstream, or it was just what was being covered at the time, or the way we were supposed to cover it. Um, but I, I, um, I, I feel like you know, having said that, there was still the language which worked to my advantage because I spoke the language of all these countries, and that was always a barrier for you know colleagues who didn't speak it. So I think that you know automatically gave me an advantage to to. Um, you know, set the narrative in a direction that they m maybe didn't see it right away because of the language barrier. Uh, but I really am trying to think of a, of a good example. Well, no, no, I'm just thinking about an example. I remember when I was in, in Lebanon and you went to the hairdresser. Yes. Point scary, yeah. Yes. Yeah, the, I, I mean, just that's an example right. of something it's that been you, a long time too. That you like, thought my, of. My brain is dead. <laughs> <laughs> you thought of only because of you know. I, well, you can say why you thought of it, but you you thought of it. I, mean, I don't know if anyone else would have thought of it, and you were able to do that. Basically, Nada went. Uh, and, and got a haircut at the place where uh, in Syria, and everybody told me, "What we go to Lebanon to get our haircut? What are you doing here?" <laughs> <laughs> but but the, the, but you basically kind of went undercover again to get your haircut to hear what was happening in a certain place, and and you it, because you you were local. You, you you could uh, casually uh, join that environment. Right. You could you could hear what was being said, and you could actually go without a visa into Syria and just kind of be under the radar. Like this is the kind of thing that like if somebody like you is not employed in our bureau, is not part of the coverage team, they won't have such a story. Yeah. Um. Anyway, not to oh. answer for you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it's, a, it's a good example. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I just want to speak, sorry, to one more point, which is actually that some of the coverage, this unique coverage, is rooted in the fact that 
women are um, not in all countries, in specific countries, operating in very misogynistic male uh, patriarchal spaces. And, um, and this, within their own publications. Exactly, within their publications, on the streets, sometimes at home. And this speaks to the savviness and to the resourcefulness and the tenacity of the women, whereby they're faced with a situation in which, okay, well, I'm not going to be able to cover this particular um, event because I'm not allowed into those spaces. So what options do I have? For example, Zainal Hayyan, who's a Syrian journalist, mm -hmm. access to a Syrian gynecological clinic to tell mm -hmm. stories of women in that clinic. And I think that that speaks to such a level, of, it's a very clever way of dealing with the restrictions that they're faced with on a day-to-day -day basis, whether it's you know their parents letting them out of the house, even if they're growing women, whether it's you know what they're wearing, it's how they move from one place to another, if they have a mahram, they're looking at them. It's, you know, the restrictions are there and they're in place, and, and what the women are doing is they're rising above them resourcefully, and um, this is at the heart of the book. This is really the, the thread that ties all of these women together, the way they rise above those challenges. Yeah. I would say that a story without a woman, woman's voice is missing half of the story. If you don't have a woman's voice in the story, you miss half of the story. Which is, and me and Anwar we were just we were covering Syria. It's, uh, our always challenge is to get a woman's voice. And women were always shy to talk. But, but, like having us, like, for instance, Nala Bakri or Weda Saad or Zara, it's like a, 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 just a, a password for them, like, okay, we can talk to you. You are from our community. You speak our language. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I have to change my accent to look more Syrian. <laughs> anyway, like, they, they feel more comfortable. Of course, like, after, like, you know, they have to find out who am I, where I'm coming from, you know, in a way. But, you find you speak Arabic. So, but it's, it's you know, like, I felt that when in my last visit to Syria, I, I was there for five months ago, and uh, actually we were like, just looking for stories, and we were walking on the street, and we were followed by, by minders all the time. And actually, uh, uh, by coincidence, I found a child, she was trying to get the water, and then I asked her, Where is, where's your house? And she said, my house is there. She pointed up to the house. Of course, the miners didn't like that. And she took us to the house. And inside the house, there was her grandmother. And she told us the whole story. It was really, like, I was telling my colleague. She told, yeah, the whole story First, can you explain about the miners? Who are the miners? Yes, they were saying, uh, yes. Usually, when you go to Syria, you are told by the government miners. They keep an eye on you, what you do, who you interview all these details. So we have to, you know, to have, you know, we have to be cautious and actually, you know, and actually they keep an eye on the, on the questions we ask. So actually and it was a challenge. Get. Yeah, of course. So it was a challenge to go to the houses and see the women inside the houses. And that woman, she, she, was, she, was, she was a grandmother, she's, uh, she's, uh, she's 55 years old, and she's raising 15 grandchildren, which is like, wow. And she has all these responsibilities, Three of her sons were like uh, were killed. One of her is missing, and she was telling us this in front of the minders, which is like was amazing. And that you know we based the story on this woman. So this is an example of always our challenge is to, to reach women. It's always a challenge for us, and we are so lucky to be and always you know, Actually, in the beginning, I used to feel like why I'm a woman, why I was born a woman. But now I feel so lucky because I'm a woman. I can reach both men and women at the same time. And both, they want to share stories with me, you know. So this is very important. I'm really, I'm very proud to be a woman and from the Middle East. <laughs> Don't you guys often feel that, that people, are, when people ask, what's it like to report as a woman in the Middle East, that they're fishing for an answer that is much harder as a woman because of all the oppression. <laughs> and, and, and I always tell them it's easier as a woman, whether you're foreign or, or you're Arab, it's like, it's like because uh, as a reporter, you somehow get given this special status as a woman, so you could talk to any men if you want, just because you're a reporter. But, but as a woman, you get to talk to women and be in spaces that men wouldn't allow to be in. So you can really be in any space. Mm -hmm. and, and it's not the, the answer that people are expecting, is it, you know? 
Um, and and the, on the Arab piece, on the, the, the native speaker of the language, on the, the you know being a part of embedded in a culture piece, I just want to go back to something that that Wayda said, which is that and, and, and for anyone in the room who doesn't know, Wayda and I have worked together uh, uh, for six or seven years covering Syria, and uh, and when we would go to the government uh, held areas. Um, they, the, those minders are, are trying to intimidate their citizens out of telling the truth to journalists. And, and something that was just indispensable uh, about the way we could work as a team is that those minders would get very focused on me as a foreigner or, or especially on a photographer because they're taking images and they're very nervous about the images. So Wega is someone who's, who's, who's fluent and who, who fits in very easily and has a special talent, by the way, also. Not just anybody can do it, but Wega has a special green thumb at getting people to talk to her easily. But being able to to uh, kind of, as we talked about uh, today, Wega, we talked about going behind the walls. And this is literal and metaphorical. And as women journalists, I think we do this especially, um, it is... Uh, going behind the surface. So when, when the, someone would be uh, monitoring what's being said on the surface, way that can be around the corner, talking to the grandma in the kitchen, or the little kid, or the mom, or someone who might be considered by the minder, by the officials, to be unimportant. But, but, but her ability to communicate with that person, to put what they say in context, and then deliver that to a reader, is what really made our team uh, special. Um, so I noticed in reading the book, that this scenario is repeated again and again in different contexts, in different cultures, in different political situations, different media. Um, so, and 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 I apologize for focusing so much on Wayda, just because I know her work inside and out and by heart. Uh, in Wayda's essay, she talks about two more situations of going behind the wall, um, and I think we can we can do a round of talking about this, and then we want to we have about twenty more minutes to hear from from audience questions. Um, but uh, this had to do with um, the walls that are now brought up by all these conflicts, by all these borders, by the, the inability to get places that we're trying to transcend with the internet, with, with, with all these technologies that let us meet a source and then keep in touch with them uh, by video chat, by, by text, by uh, different uh, electronic means of keeping in communication. So uh, Waida uh, uh, met one guy, I think initially online, um, uh, who was uh, stuck in the siege of Homs in Syria and was able to follow his trajectory through a very, very uh, heartbreaking uh, evolution from, from a very normal guy to somebody who became extremely radicalized, got married, and ended up uh, killing himself as a suicide uh, bomber for, for ISIS, something that you would never have expected when you first met him. Um, on the other hand, we met a guy in uh, Palmyra in Syria uh, uh, before that area was taken over by ISIS, he was one of about 20 uh, security guys uh, assigned to like keep an eye on us. And uh, through like some little flirtation, he, he got he got uh, he and Wade to exchange numbers, and and uh, we kept in touch with this guy, asking him different questions about what was happening in his life. He was a, a normal police officer recruited to act uh, almost as a soldier um, at a time when the government was running out of. Uh, cannon fodder, and he ended up being sent to Palmyra in the in the Syrian desert when uh, ISIS was taking over, and and the government was basically leaving it to be taken. But they sent a few people to put up a token fight where all the important officers were escaping, and this guy was eventually trapped there and was eventually found by ISIS and, and killed. And once we heard that he was killed. Uh, Wade spent a lot of time investigating to, to find out exactly what did happen to this guy and what were the witnesses. But in the meantime, we had the guy's um, uh, text messages and, and sort of uh, photos and, and daily exchanges of, of what was happening in his life. So that he became so that both the suicide bomber and this government soldier, you know, a guy working for a very repressive regime army and a guy who had started out as a protester but became an extremist uh, militant. Yeah. Both of these guys are not on the surface like sympathetic characters, but somehow we got to know them through uh, through Weda's ability to go behind the wall. So, so I would like you to just talk a little bit about what that was like for you and how um, you know maybe there's something that I didn't mention, which which uh, which can can explain to people what how you actually made that happen. And, and I'd like to hear a little bit about your own version of going behind the wall, and then we go to the questions of the audience. 
actually, when I started covering the whole story, it was something I wasn't planning to do it. I was like, I always uh, like to listen to stories. It's, it's a passion. I love stories. So I have the, the patience and I listen to stories. And all these people, they have really many stories to talk. And they would, you know, they would love to, to share stories with women. So, and I, you know, I was, I was patient and I, sometimes we used to say hours and hours and, you know, sometimes the, 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 the you know, we start something, we talk about something nonsense, like something about, you know, what he's eating, what he's drinking, what, whatever. And they, after that, one, two hours, he, they started saying, like, sharing the serious things. So, uh, but uh, my uh, curiosity started, like, just, be, you know, growing uh, more and more when, uh, when the situation in Syria, started to get worse, you know, and especially when ISIS just uh, became very active in Syria. So, um, actually, uh, those people, they were, uh, most of them, they were feeling lonely. And, you know, when you are feeling lonely, you want someone to chat with. And fortunately, I had the, the time to chat with. They were like, you know, they want to just talk and share. And, and they were feeling good, you know, they were missing their moms, they were missing their sisters, their love. And uh, you know they uh, they want to sing, but and this, you know I was like just putting down my notes. I never thought that I'm gonna use these notes later. And actually, uh, the thing that they were like, uh, for instance, the that guy who, who, who became ISIS, he he was like all the time he, he proposed to me in a way like I was laughing, <laughs> like <laughs> why? <laughs> you know, it was like something I was really laughing in a way. But uh, when, I, when I heard the, the, you know, he became a suicide bomber, it was like I was, that was the, the, the biggest shock in my life. Like, this is my first contact whom I was chatting with and, and he ended up like killing people. You know, it, it was like something like he thought, he thought like he's, 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 he was 21 year old. He's, you know, I, you know he's, he's innocent. He started as, as an innocent man and like he was demonstrating in homes. And then look what happened to him, like he's he's seeing people, like why? And later I had this soldier, he was like a teenager, he saw a woman wearing a jeans in Palmera, he liked her, and then you know, he said like, yeah, I will chat with you. And you know, I was like, okay, we can chat. It was, it was, it was really a, a, a challenge for me because chatting with a regime soldier, with a senior regime, regime soldier, is something unusual. And actually if they found out about him, he would, he would end up in, in prison. And he was sharing all these stories for me. So, uh, but uh, all these uh, stories end, ended up in a tragic way, really. And it, it affected me a lot. Just, uh, you know, I know, and Anne just knows, she knows that. And uh, I, I just, I went through a deep depression, and especially with the soldier, because the soldier, he was really very, like, he was very young, he has all these dreams, and he was giving me, like, um, tips, advice for my life and everything. So the day I heard that he, he died, I cried. It's, I don't know what, what happened. I cried and cried. And then, you know, I, I was in the office with Anne and I collapsed. I, I never thought that this would happen to him. That was the first experience of my life, really. And later I got used to that. I, I don't say I got used to this, you know, because you will never get used to that. This is it. You know, every time they, they tell you, okay, this is, you know, he died, but I, I will never get used to that. And this is, I will mention something about um, Khalid Khalidi, his uh, senior writer. Um, he's very, he's amazing. And um, in Lina Sinjab documentary, he said something like, uh, he said, uh, you know, oh, death, why you miss me a thousand times? And uh, actually, uh, death, sometimes it's, it's, sometimes missing people, sometimes not. This is what happened to Anthony. You know, death never missed, missed him, and but death missed us. Maybe we don't know. They missed the other contacts, which I know. But other you know, people, they they um, they always complain to me. They said, "Why death is missing us? We wanna die." And this is the the level of misery we reach in the Middle East. You know, that you deal with this every day, and you you don't know how to deal with that. You know. Just how to deal with this? You don't know. It's I don't have an answer for that. Yeah, and how, how do we as journalists incorporate these personal, extremely personal experiences, extremely emotional um, uh, experiences that entire societies are going through? Um, you know, people, we don't want to characterize emotion as a woman thing, 
On the other hand, women have a way of being a little more comfortable to express these things in our way. Um, so maybe you guys want to close just with with how, how you process as members of the societies that I've been talking about here that are going through huge upheavals and as analysts and writers about them. How do you balance that? Like, like, how, how, how do you, um, you know, navigate that as a writer? Um, I'll talk about Lebanon and when, when the protests started in Lebanon, I was, um, you know, awestruck and, um, you know, I haven't worked in journalism in a very long time, but I did that and I still feel like I'm a journalist. And, but this is my country and this is something that so many of us have been waiting for so long. You know, my friends, my family, and everybody. So, you know, I, I struggled with how I wanted to react to this. Um, but, you know, I, I, was, I was really, really inspired and impressed and happy that this finally happened, um, but I don't know if I am um, to cover it right now or to write about it, and I don't really know how I would, um, how, how I would approach that. Um, I think it's a very, very, it's a very delicate situation when you see something and you really support it because it's, you know, these people are asking um, for the rights, so, I, and you know, I can't but support what they're asking for. But then again, as a journalist, I don't know where where I can stop, where, where I stand, mm -hmm. because this is my country. Um, so luckily, I'm not coming in. <laughs> <laughs> uh, actually, I think this is a really good way to end the discussion, because there are two essays in particular in this book, which I hope everyone here will find, that deal specifically with this question. Just being a bit of a sales plug here. Mm -hmm. um, so Nur Malas is a Syrian American journalist who works for the Wall Street Journal and in covering Syria she was faced precisely with this dilemma. What do you do when you are so emotionally invested in a story and you have very um, strong views yourself? How do you maintain that distance as a journalist? Um, there's no clear answer. It's it's a constant struggle um, and you must read the chapter um, to, to, to get um, her insights on that. And another one by Natasha Yeswick, which in particular I'm really fond of because it doesn't follow a traditional arc of a, of a, a non-fiction narrative piece. Um, some of the women in this book are of dual nationality. They struggle with their identity. I'm one of those women. We're part of the border story of the Arab world in which there is a huge diaspora because people were born, um, either they were born into wars and their families fled the wars, they, their families fled and they were born into that generation. There's a huge refugee crisis and so on. And, and um, even the question or the premise of writing or working for Western media for Natasha Yesbik as a Lebanese American is something that destroys her on a day-to-day -day basis with every single word she writes. And she actually, she uses those exact words is that she's feeding a pipeline of sorts. Um, and uh, she struggles with that notion of, you know, how do I maintain that distance knowing that I'm working for Western media? And I'm so close to that story myself and I have my own identity issues. So, um, yes, all of that to say, uh, these questions are dealt with substantially in this book by several of the women. And there are no answers. And there are no answers. <laughs> there are no answers. Yes. Can we open that up, Alison? Yes, you have that'd be lovely. Um, can we we went a little over because I can't help being fascinated with everything you guys are having to say, but but, uh, but we would like to hear from the audience any uh, other questions for our panelists. Don't be shy. <laughs> I'd just like to say that as a, a very faithful reader of your reporting, I'm so glad to have had a chance to hear both of you. It's really wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. I would just want to make a comment. Just happens today is Human Rights Day. I just came from the UN. I'm a former UN Under Secretary of Communications. And we started a, <laughs> we had a motto at the time that women's rights are human rights because there was a problem with that. And we had a conference in Beijing summit on women. And we held that motto as the most important purpose of the meeting. So I think it's a good occasion that this is happening at today. And uh, I, from practice, I'm convinced 
that women are the most perceptive and creative communicators. By practice, in my own department, I headed the Department of Public Information in the UN, I raised, I happened on sheer competence to raise the level of women from 20% in management to 80%, because, not because I wanted to be nice, <laughs> but because I found out that this is the most effective way of doing it, especially when I went to the field, a place like Eritrea, to give independence to the country or somewhere. And I, I by chance, even the second child, Butros Gharis, told me, what are you taking with you? All women? <laughs> they happen to be the good communicators. You were just taking the best communicators. Exactly. They and to be all it women. just happened when we arrived there, it just happened to be International Women's Day. That much. And women, without me telling them what to do, they just went to the streets and told them, listen, this is your day, Women's Day. And there was a song which was done at that time, Your Day, Women's Day. And suddenly we had all the people on our side mm -hmm. just because of this effect. So I, I really greet, greet you for this occasion and I really welcome what you're doing. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. And I think it uh, really needs us as you can see exactly the same phenomenon. <laughs> I have a, a question, or a comment. Uh, the, one of the themes that I saw in a lot of these essays is the limitations of the whole genre of journalism as a way of getting at the stories that you found interesting. Um, and I think that's in almost all the essays I read in the book. Um, and I, I was wondering what, what you have to say about that, sort of the, 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 the flaws of the genre. And I also was, was thinking about what does uh, the elevation of someone like Rula Khalaf to the editorship of the FT say about whether the genre of journalism itself is going to change as Arab women reporters who are steeped in the reality of the ground come up to the positions of power where they might possibly transform the way. Uh, and I know you were tweeting about this, so I, I, yes. I'm sure you have yes. to yes. say. Yes. Uh, I'm so glad you bring that up. Um, that's an excellent question. I think there have been strides forward. forward. Um, also this year, as we saw two Egyptian women won the Pulitzer Prize in International Reporting, along with a Yemeni uh, male journalist for their coverage of Yemen. Um, I think it's great. There's absolutely, um, uh, you know, the, there's nothing negative you can say about it. I think that these women having the understanding that they have and reaching these levels of seniority, um, it's, it reflects um, in their coverage. I think actually um, the FD does excellent um, foreign correspondence out of the Middle East in specific, and that Irma Khalid has a lot to do with it. Um, in, in the way that she's directed um, that um, division of the FT. And um, I think that it's, uh, it's long overdue. I mean, it's the first female editor um, of the FT in 141, I think 131 years. <laughs> but um, again, <laughs> there have been positive um, steps forward. In terms of limits of the genre, that's also such a great question. It's, it's part of the reason why I wanted it to be packaged as a as an anthology in the memoir um, or nonfiction narrative space in the Western publishing world, because those limitations are completely removed. Um, these women are not writing journalistically; they're taking a step, um, you know, behind that, and they're thinking more holistically about how the journalism has affected them. And in doing so, when you're reading these essays, you're getting a completely different side of the story. You're getting how the story is affecting them themselves personally how they've been reporting on trauma for years and how they themselves have been through trauma and they're only just starting to process that trauma and therefore there are no limitations in this sort of writing. Now of course that's unique, it's not that every journalist can do this because suddenly you're going from journalism into a different genre altogether, but um, that was my way of, you know, of addressing it and I would hope that in the same way many Western correspondents write memoirs and you know thousands and thousands of words of their own personal reflection on a region that we will start to see, um, you know, 80,000 words from each woman in this book. No pressure. Yes, <laughs> 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 actually, yeah, those are both great. Yeah. I would just say, as a Western reader, um, having read the book, and, and I'll make a plug, it's... Um, <laughs> It, it, will put you, it will put you in a different place to read it. Um, I've been reading it a lot in the last few days, and I go out on the street and I think, my goodness, where am I? <laughs> it has really changed my perspective. Um, that's one thing. It's a fantastic book, and I think um, if you want 
these wonderful women to autograph it, you should maybe get a piece of paper and get their autograph and then buy the book and put it in. <laughs> um, just being resourceful. But I, I think what it showed me um, is a window into a world that I don't know much about. But on the other hand, it showed me that it is not so far away. It is not so different. The experiences that these women are talking about, it's as if they've been there all along, we just haven't heard them. And so this book helps you hear them. And that's been a wonderful thing about it. And I can only say to multiply it would be. Yeah, I, I love that you say that because actually um, when I approached editing this collection, um, I didn't want there to be any filters whatsoever. When you are approaching journalism for any outlet, whether it's Western or otherwise, there are filters there. So actually, when it came to both way and another, you're both great examples. I never told you to write anything specific. I said, write what you want, the story that speaks to you. And there's a level of intimacy and nuance as a result of that. I didn't guide any of the women. I was just sitting, I mean, I wasn't sitting back. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing, but, um, I waited for the 19 essays to come in. You know, I helped guide them when they needed the help. But there was a level of, um, I would say, the editorial um, uh, intervention was, was next to nothing, really next to nothing in terms of the actual essay content. And I think it's really notable how many genres you got just by opening the door and letting people send you what they send you. Because Huayna's is like a classic essay of like the story behind the story, how I got these incredible stories that you may have already read, but when you hear about my experience getting it, it's another story. You have like Nada's essay, which is a very personal history. You have uh, some essays that were almost like psychedelic in their sort of um, almost abstract kind of riffing on, on ideas that were incredibly moving, but were not, like you said, they didn't fit into like a particular genre or structure. And I think it's very challenging for journalists to step outside the, the journalistic framework. So you, you did these writers a, like a favor, I think, to, to really invite them to, to do that. It's a beautiful result. I know, I'm saying that it's all them. I mean, a lot of them were skeptical at first that anyone would even want to read their stories. I'm looking at Wait, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, it's a testament to their bravery. <laughs> Do we have time for, for two more questions? Yes, go ahead. Hi, um, well thank you both for all of you for sharing your stories. Um, my question kind of has to do with, you talk about your ties to the land that you're covering, and then also by covering these conflicts you're going to inevitably have faced death and, and a very sort of like immediate reaction. Did you ever experience any survivor's guilt and did that spur you to write more as, as knowing that you may be the voice for someone that can no longer speak or no longer being present? Or did you ever find that you need to step back by dealing with this idea of recovering lands and regions and, and sort of like culture that you're so closely tied to? Yeah, I just I'll answer this because uh, the context that I have here, uh, for me personally, I have my like, families these contacts, they want us to write more about their sons or their, you know, you know, because I was communicating with them you know, on a daily basis. So basically, the mothers or the brothers, they they see something, so so sometimes they they reach me and they said they they ask me to write more about what they they shared with me. So it was like a, those people they were sharing like their will, you know, like before. Sometimes they tell me before I die, please write this. And they won't they, they, they won't even share this with their mothers. So they you know they, they, they go without you know without saying anything, but I have the story. So their mothers they, they want to read it more and more. I, for instance I have the the, 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 the soldier story, his sister wants to read the story because she's missing part of that and since her brother was on you know daily basis, so she wants to know more about her brother. So I feel like I have more responsibility now just to, to write about it. You know, and just to publish more about it. Um, I love that you asked a question about guilt in specific because I think besides resilience, it is the most prominent theme in this book. I often say that this was a very meta book for me because the women felt guilty that they were not doing enough because of all of the tragedy in the region and like, you know, why is their story important? What about the stories I've been covering? And I was feeling guilty. I mean, that's, you know, guilt was actually rooted in why, partially in why it was volume together because I recognize my own privilege as living in the Western world and having a Western passport. So in fact, I think it's actually one of the driving factors in the book that makes um, 
some of the writing very unique because I don't think that that feel I don't see that feeling existing among um, male um, correspondents. I might be wrong there. I don't want to make any negative assumptions here, but it's um, it's so prominent, and I think uh, the women deal with it with um, with great uh, difficulty. It's not something again that's ever resolved. It's on a day to day basis where I'm so lucky. But what I need to do, my responsibility is to tell these stories, and I'm going to keep on doing it. And the way that I dealt with it was putting together the stories of these women, hoping that they would, you know, be motivated to, to tell the stories um, in, I think, a deeper sense uh, later on in their careers. Um, it, you know, Survivor's Guild that's such a um, such a big big term, um, but I think, you know. Throughout the years that I worked, I think I um, I struggled with that a lot because, and which made me feel guilty about sometimes not feeling the survivor's guilt because I think it's it, a lot of guilt. It's a lot of guilt. <laughs> yes, guilt. but but you know you just so many deaths happen throughout the, the years, but also in your relationship to these people. You know, some of them you, you know, some of them are just complete strangers. Even. Even those who died right next to you, and so after a certain period of time, you just you're numb. You, it just doesn't. It's just another story that you're going to write about, and then you feel guilty about that, yeah. not about being a survivor. Mm -hmm. I, I I often uh, come up with the, the metaphor of the funnel, and I, and I speak also really to, like, for a few uh, colleagues of ours who were male um, who. Who um, you know, we had a, a team of about five or six people, mostly uh, Syrian, Lebanese, or, or, or others. But but uh, like I thought of our team as a funnel that's that's like absorbing like a huge number of stories, like like this big, and then then like all of those stories are somehow physically passing through us and as a group, and then we're we're bringing them down to just the straw of the funnel, which is what we put in the paper. Mm -hmm. So like all of that has passed through our like collective body as a team and 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 we have to put out what comes out of the funnel, but it's never enough. It's mm -hmm. never you, you always feel bad that it wasn't this much, mm -hmm. but of course it would also be physically impossible to do that. Sure. And I think also what's unique about this book specifically when it comes to womanhood um, is that a lot of the guilt is rooted as well in failed marriages in not being mothers in the way that these women think they should be and having to balance the expectations society has of a woman with a career too. And, and that is a very, very dominant theme when it comes to guilt in specific. And and, and at the very same time, so many of these women have, have had huge family responsibilities and you know, supporting family members uh, financially, emotionally, um, in every other way. So yeah, one more please. Sure, it's out there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um. So this might be kind of like a lame question to end on, but I'm just wondering, like, what are the practical concerns to get, you know, Arab women to write? Uh, how do we get women in, you know, because like in the U.S. we have a problem with representation, getting people to write stories, and that's why that reflects on the front pages of our newspapers, and that's why we don't hear about some of these important issues. Um. I'm sure there are issues like surrounding pay and surrounding benefits and stuff so I'm just wondering like how writing is so important and it's, it's so important to get women to write and Arab women to write how do we how do we get that to happen you know the practical concerns how do we solve them I, I mean I was going to say Anne is actually perfectly placed to answer this question but I think it's about having allies actually mm -hmm. it's about having allies in the industry whereby you've got um, particular editors I mean uh, female Western correspondents in the Middle East are really, um, there's, they, you know, they're a huge network, of very, very um, uh, high level top class reporting coming from female Western correspondents who recognize the importance of Arab women's voices and who are then um, recruiting them and um, bringing them in and including more and more bylines. And I think that's one way to bring their voices or, or to make Arab women's voices more prevalent in, in the dominant narrative. Um, but perhaps Anne, you can elaborate a little bit more on that. Well, I was about to say that, that in a way that it feels wrong to, to try to answer that as the you know white non Arab person here, but on the other hand, it is our job. It is exactly the job of the sort of dominant groups in media to uh, make that room and and to recognize the value of how that will transform the media landscape, and at the same time that that white and and 
non-white women are are fighting for their own place in journalism. I mean, it's not it, that that place is still not uh, secured, unfortunately, um, even even today. Uh, but but it's inseparable. You know, we talk a lot about intersectionality these days, but it is actually inseparable uh, to to open those doors for each other on the way. Um, now, it is true, as as I have said, that that actually the the majority, well, partly by coincidence and partly because of the way that the media landscape has uh, evolved since 9-11 with the huge uh, uptick in demand for international correspondence, especially in the Middle East and, and Central Asia, um, that did actually open a lot of doors for younger journalists who were, because of generationally, a larger percentage of women. Now, by coincidence, the majority of your chiefs uh, of major media in the Middle East are women and have been for, for maybe the past uh, five, five or seven years. So so uh, that that's great, but it's not enough. And, and the, the so even as we're still fighting for more space at the table for ourselves to, to make sure that we are bringing uh, all the voices around us of speaking all languages, coming from all uh, regions, and, and and not only being inclusive in sort of a decorative kind of way, but actually being inclusive by having those people be an integral part of the team who mm -hmm. is helping not only translate for the story or fill a hole in the story, but actually to shape the story. Mm -hmm. And I can say that for the reason that our team was great in, in Beirut was because Huayda and others were part of shaping the story, not just that we that you know somebody like me or Ben Hubbard called them and says, well, I need this or I need that, mm -hmm. you know, and we're going to fill that hole. It's like no, from the from ground from the ground up, from day one of conceptualizing the story and figuring out what the story even is, it, it they're they're a voice at the table to to know like what what that story is going to be and maybe way that can talk about it. Yeah, I just I'll add briefly because I can explain this, but the, actually I, I'll talk about the New York Times and Washington Post. We have like all these stories coming from the Middle East, and when we have big stories coming from the Middle East, when you add like local contributor or local violent, like the violent for local, it gives more value to the story because because it shows like there was someone really like working on the story, which is like he speaks the language, he knows the area, and he was like really working on that story in, like, just in a, in, a, in a very effective way. So it, it, of course. It, any story that is published, and these two, at least I'm giving an example about these publications, it, it will add value to the story. Maybe that's a good one to end on. Yes. And we'll see in an, another year or so if we've progressed. Is that right? <laughs> Thank you to this amazing panel Thank and you just for, for being the journalist you are Thank and for being the friends you are. Thank you. <laughs>